I would like uh, everyone for now, if you can please do uh, silence your phone. And uh, in a minute, we are going to start uh, this session. Uh, prior to starting this session, I would like also at one point to introduce our guests in here. I will start with uh, Mr. Abdullah Hamarshe. Abdullah Hamarshe is the CEO and the co-founder of uh, Zimam Palestine. Zimam Palestine is uh, a national Palestinian movement uh, that focuses on work in the Gaza Strip and also uh, the West Bank. They work with youth in Palestine in order to confront radicalism, extremism, and at the same time, uh, prepare the ground for a two-state solution. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Rawan Ouda. Rawan Ouda is the managing director of the New Story Leadership, an organization that brings Palestinian and Israeli together in DC and gives them the tools and skills to create a change once they retain home. And also, also we have with us Mr. Uh, Bashar Al Izza, and uh, he uh, is a uh, Palestinian that had uh, finished his uh, PhD in political economy from the United States, and he also has a master in management. Uh, Mr. Bashar al Azza is uh, one of the youngest elected members of the Palestinian National Council uh, and Palestinian uh, Central uh, Council. As you know today, uh, this session will be focused on political organizing in Palestine. And uh, we are going to shed the light on opportunities, also on challenges when it comes to doing politics in Palestine, in particular, working with the youth. So by the end of this session, uh, you will understand uh, what grassroots organizations working in Palestine, what also political uh, parties working in Palestine, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities that faces political parties and also grassroots organizations working in Palestine. Uh, by the end of the session, uh, we are going to have a Q&A, and I wanted everybody to be prepared for the Q&A uh, once we finish uh, the portion that has to do with the speakers. Have your questions ready and line by the microphone. Thank you very much. My first question will go to Mr. Al Azza. What are the challenges and opportunities for the rising generation? And how do they feel about the future of their people's leadership? Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be here today. I'm happy to see a lot of uh, familiar faces. Well, this is a big question today. I mean, the Palestinian society is a young society. 70% of the Palestinians are under the age of 26, making somebody at the age of 38 an old guy. <laughs> and this is actually the opportunity that the Palestinians have today. With such a young community and young generation, uh, I'd see this challenge as an opportunity challenge. And from there, I drive the rest of my discussion today. Uh, the challenge that we face today is that we have to understand that the Palestinian society have to deal with two issues, the daily life of the Palestinians and the occupation. And these are two separate systems that the Palestinian young population have to deal with in their da daily activism when it comes to how they are organized. And from there, you can see we really understand how those people are looking into to be part of the political spectrum of the Palestinian society. So right now, in the Palestinian structure, you have the PLO, which is a representative of the Palestinians, not only in the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, but also all over the world. And this is the entity that holds the political arm and the political uh, aspect of the, of the Palestinians. And you have in Palestine today the PA, which is the entity that was created after all the agreement to manage the daily life of the Palestinians. And these are two separate organizations when it comes to a system by itself. Now, the young Palestinians today they, are, they see themselves very interested in joining and becoming part of the political system. And this is so because they see that their participation should be, very, uh, should be viewed as, as, a, as a way uh, to be 
that we have seen that, especially if we go back to the Arab Spring and what happened in, Sy in Syria, a bit going on in Lebanon and Egypt and so on, they understand that maybe right now being politically active and participating is the right way to do it rather than just going to the street. And this is very important. And I believe that we have heard lately the President Abbas calling for election. I think we, he's very serious to go for election. And this is gonna be a very test, a very good test on how the young population is gonna be receptive to this. Are the young population gonna organize themselves to be part of this election on the PA level? Are we gonna see young people become either active with existing political parties or active with independent groups to be part of this election? I believe that the challenge here right now is how would this young population that have not seen elections since 2006, there's a whole new generation that came up since the last election of the PA. How can we get this generation to group in either with existing political parties or with new independent groups that will be take, to be part of that election? I think that is the challenge that we need to work on in the near future. Thank you, great. Uh, I will ask a question uh, next. Uh, Mr. Abdullah Hamarshe, as a representative of a civil grassroots movement in Palestine, please tell us why we need such grassroots movements in Palestine while there are over 20 Palestinian political parties. Uh, I want to speak Arabic uh, for uh, uh, to uh, speak about details about this issue, my English a little bit, uh, and as can to help uh, me for uh, Thank you, Aiz. Thank you, everybody, for coming. بداية الحزب اللي هو الوطن والفصائل والحركات الوطنية الفلسطينية خلقت من أجل تحرير فلسطين يمكن من أكثر من خمسة وخمسين عام. وهاي الفصائل خلقت وانبثقت من أجل بناء دولة فلسطينية ومن أجل إنهاء الاحتلال الفلسطيني لفلسطين لكن مع تطور البرامج وتطور الحياة السياسية في فلسطين لاحظنا ونلاحظ عدم تطور في هاي البرامج نحن كمؤسسات نقدر ونحترم ونبجل هاي التضحيات لهاي الفصائل لكن للأسف الشديد لم نلاحظ تجديد في برامجها في أطرها في سياساتها يعني من أجل إعادة تنظيم الحياة السياسية في فلسطين ومن أجل يعني مواكبتها للعصر. Uh, so his uh, answer first goes. So these uh, 20 or so Palestinian parties in Palestine were established prior to the 1967 war. So we're talking about almost uh, 53 years, 55 years. And their platform spoke about uh, liberating uh, Palestine, meaning uh, Yaffa, Safad, uh, Haifa, Al um, Mijdal. And uh, since then, uh, 53 years later, now we're in 2019, uh, this is not the case, because as most of you knows, that the Palestinian Liberation, Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1980, uh, 1988 had introduced a new vision to end this uh, conflict. And the Palestinian Liberation Organization uh, was content, and is still content, with the 22% to establish a national home for the Palestinian people in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem as the capital. Uh, so. Abdullah said that he has all the respect for the Palestinian political parties. Those are the ones uh, who fought and sacrificed over the years uh, in order to keep uh, Palestine and to keep the dream of having an independent Palestinian state. Unfortunately, uh, these political parties did not introduce changes to their platform, in particular after a Chairman Yasser Arafat in 1993, with the Oslo Agreement, exchanged letters with the Prime Minister Ishaq Rabin, in which Chairman Yasser Arafat had recognized Israel and the 1967 border, and also uh, Prime Minister Ishaq Rabin had recognized the PLO 
as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. نقطة ثانية يعني الأحزاب والفصائل الفلسطينية يعني ممكن أنا كنت أحد هاي الأحزاب يعني مشارك في هاي الأحزاب أنا كنت فتح وأنا في الانتفاضة الأولى وبداية الانتفاضة الثانية لكن نلاحظ إنه هاي الأحزاب لا تمثل جميع أطياف الشعب الفلسطيني وهناك في أصوات يعني في صوت مش مش مسموع وصوت بده يشارك أو صوت بده يشارك يعني من خلال المجتمع المدني من خلال يشارك في همومه في على لا تقليص همومنا في الهم الاقتصادي الاجتماعي التنموي وهنا بيجي حاجة لا يكون في دور تكاملي بين الأحزاب الوطنية الفلسطينية وبين الحركات أو الجمعيات والمؤسسات المدنية. Abdullah said during the first uprising, he was also part of the Palestinian political parties. Actually, he uh, was part of one of the biggest uh, Palestinian political parties, that is Fatah, uh, uh, with its chairman Yasser Arafat. Uh, however, he also mentioned uh, that not everybody in Palestine is part of these political parties. And there is a big majority among Palestinian people who are not part of these parties. So here comes uh, the role of uh, uh, grassroots organizations uh, opening a venue for, uh, for the people uh, to be able to participate in the political process. النقطة الثالثة وهي أنا بشوفها مهمة جدا إنه دور المؤسسات المجتمع المدني والجمعيات والحركات القاعدية كمان مهم في التواصل مع المجتمعات في أوروبا في أمريكا وأيضا عمل اختراق للمجتمع الإسرائيلي من أجل يعني الشرح عن الصراع الفلسطيني الإسرائيلي ومن أجل عمل هذا الاختراق في المجتمع الإسرائيلي من أجل إنهاء الاحتلال وعمل أو ضم أصوات من والتأثير على الأصوات في الداخل الإسرائيلي من أجل إنهاء الصراع وإنهاء الاحتلال الاحتلال الإسرائيلي لفلسطين. عبد الله said the most important point for him is point number three. There is the, the, the difference between Palestinian political parties and civil organizations or grassroots organizations is the fact that civil uh, society organizations and grassroots organizations has connections uh, with the international world, for example, Europe, uh, with America, and also, to some extent, uh, these grassroots organizations and civil society organizations uh, also uh, open channels uh, with the Israeli public and try to find partners for peace inside Israel and also try to influence uh, the Israeli public uh, toward uh, accepting peace with the Palestinians and the end of the occupation. Okay. So now uh, I will ask a question to uh, Rawan. Uh, Rawan, how does your organization encourage Palestinians to become more politically involved? Oh, it's on. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, that's a great question. I th new story leadership and what we do represents creating a new story. And I'd like to acknowledge that me standing here, to, sitting here today as a 24-year-old Palestinian woman from Hawada is the new story. <laughs> so how does my organization encourage Palestinians to become more involved? I think I can describe it in one word, empowerment. That is what's missing within Palestinian youth and the younger generation. And talking about actually raising their voices. So what New Story Leadership does, it recruits Palestinians from Gaza, from East Jerusalem, West Bank, Hebron, refugee camps, and it brings them to the political capital of the world, Washington, D.C. And what we do, we tell them, you're here now. You're going to speak up, stand up, and raise your voice. We, we met with Senator Bernie Sanders, and I want to share this uh, story that explains the impact. Um, one of our NSL delegates, Nidal, told the senator, 
Senator Bernie Sanders, my name is Nidal. I'm a nurse from Hebron. While wearing my Red Cross uniform, giving first aid in Hebron, I was shot by an IDF soldier. Senator Bernie Sanders, you need to understand that Palestinian medical staff need to be protected. The senator looked at him, called everyone in his staff, interns, staff, foreign policy, the chief, and told them, you need to take down notes and looked at our Palestinians and said, what else do I need to know? That is one sentence that Palestinians are desperate, desperate to hear. What do I need to know to make sure you are the next generation that is going to lead a new democratic Palestinian state? And that is how we do that. Thank you, thank you, great. Uh, Mr. el -Azza, in general, we see that younger generation leads the street change protest as in Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia. But when it comes to participation in governments after the success of these revolutions, it's almost insignificant. What's the problem? This is exactly, we have to go back to the challenge, which is how you get the young people to participate. And there is hard work. If you, go, if you want to get a university degree, you have to go to college. If you want to be a politician, you have to go through the system of being a politician. And this is exactly where the problem is. At a young age, most people are at the front of their life decisions, either to pursue their career in a specific business or a specific sector. And at the same time, political activism consumes a lot of time. And this is exactly where the challenge that young people have today, not only in Palestine, but all across the world. And I think this challenge is an important, it, it's very important to really look into how the older generation of politicians could give a hand to the younger generation to follow on the steps that they already have. And this is why I'm a believer of what I call contiguity of generations. I disagree with no continuity and contiguity between generations. The idea that each generation have its own attributes and not connect to the other generation is a, is a big mistake. In our case, in the Palestinian side, I see there is contiguity with the older generation. The current leadership of the Palestinians in the West Bank is, that can say it's very close to the population. I mean, here, you've got Dr. Saab sitting in the front row. We see him every day. It's not somebody like strange to me. And I think what we need is to really invest on this contiguity, both from the elder generation and the young generation have to understand and be recipient to the idea of this contiguity. I wanted to just point out something. The elephant in the room is occupation. Let's not forget that. And in, when you look at that elephant, you have to understand that our struggle, I have a problem with people asking the Palestinian to be perfect under occupation. I do have a problem with this. We are under occupation. And under occupation, you cannot be perfect. The perfection, and oh, if you are perfect, then we'll give you your state. It doesn't work that way. Give me my state and then start measuring me. And that's exactly what we should look at. Now, on, on the last point on young generation, I believe that even, yes, we mentioned there's 20 plus organizations already in the, in the PLO. I'm part of one that was small. I came in, I joined, and I worked my way up. And I think if there is 20 plus, we need to renovate some of them. The young people can come into those organizations, renovate them, and build from within rather than going into uh, something that doesn't exist. Even if they want to start a new one, the PLO system allows this. We have the Mubadara, the initiative came up uh, you know, after, the, after this creation of the PLO. Yes. And it's, it's now a member in the PLO. There is, what we need is we need the young people to organize. Let me just say how, and this is how I believe. How the young people can organize is simple. They need to get together and they need to decide what is exactly their vision. If their vision is to be the next parliament member of the national council, sorry, of the, PLO, of the PA Legislative Council. There is going to be election, hopefully, in the next six months. The president already said that. We know that's going to happen. They need to come with a list, independent list of youth, 20, 25 people from Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank. They can organize themselves. They can even get funding from Palestinian private sector. They can have a list, and they can run for election. Maybe your friends can come with a list of independents and run for election. We need to work. And if we don't do the work, we're not going to get the outcome. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, Mr. Hamarshe, can you please tell us what your activities include in Palestine 
and the challenges you confront? We have more challenges. Uh, I want to start about what we do in, in Palestine with youth and with the, the uh, social in, uh, in uh, West Bank and in Gaza. بداية نحن بنشتغل مع الشباب الفلسطيني ومع المجتمع الفلسطيني من أجل بناء مجتمع ديمقراطي قادر إنه يكون ويساهم في بناء دولته الفلسطينية المستقلة المزدهرة. So first I wanted to start by saying that we work with the Palestinian youth both in the Gaza Strip and uh, the West Bank. Uh, we work with them in order to prepare the ground for a future Palestinian state that is independent and also democratic. We work in parallel with Palestinian political parties in order to prepare the youth and give them the skills to be able to participate in the political process. احنا عندنا برنامج تدريبي هو الاساسي في بناء قدرات الشباب ونتعامل بشكل شهري مع حوالي 500 شاب وصبيه في الضفه الغربيه وقطاع غزه من خلال برنامج تدريبي اساسي ومتقدم ومؤخرا الحاضنه الشبابيه اللي هي باكوره أنشطتنا من أجل خلق قيادات شابة قادرة أنها تمثل نفسها وتمثل مجتمعاتها الفلسطينية من خلال تمكينهم وإعطائهم الخبرات الكافية أنهم يشاركوا في الانتخابات أو يشاركوا في البلديات أو الانتخابات على مستوى الجامعات في كل المجالات وهي الحاضنة إن شاء الله في خلال السنة بتكون أولى تخريج لأول فوج في المؤسسة عندنا Great. So Abdullah uh, said that uh, they work with almost 500 uh, Palestinian youth, both in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And they do so three, uh, three programs. Uh, the basic training program, the advanced training program, and they have something special that is called the leadership incubator. And uh, all these three programs are supposed to produce uh, young Palestinian uh, moderate leaders that can be leaders within their community and also participate hopefully in the election at one point. Yeah. Um, برامجنا التوعوية فمن خلال سياسة كافية والدبات ومؤتمرات ورشات هاي دائما إحنا من يعني منحرص على خلقها فمن خلال إدارتها من قبل الشباب والمتطوعين في المحافظات الفلسطينية وقطاع غزة وأيضا تهدف هاي إلى كسر الفجوة بين القيادة السياسية وبين الشارع الفلسطيني من خلال تشبيكهم عن طريق عمل وتصميم هاي المبادرة هاي المؤتمرات وهي الندوات. So along with the training programs and also the uh, leadership incubator, he also mentioned that uh, the youth, the volunteers of the of Zimam, also engaged other Palestinian youth, both in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and also East Jerusalem. The future capital of the Palestinian state. Yeah. And uh, he also talked about initiatives uh, that uh, the youth introduced in coordination with the Zimam leadership in order to bridge the gap between the political parties and also the political leadership and the street. Mm. ايضا للمبادرات والانشطه التي تتقاطع مع هموم المواطن الفلسطيني والمناسبات الوطنيه الفلسطينيه والتحديات الوطنيه الفلسطينيه ومثال على ذلك يعني باخر نشاط عملناه كان في اريحه مش اخر نشاط يعني هو يمكن قبل سنه بس هذا مثال جيد لاعطاء مثل على الانشطه اللاعنفيه والمقاومه اللي احنا بنحاول نغرسها في شبابنا الفلسطيني زلنا على خط 90 في اريحه حملنا يافطه طولها حوالي 1000 متر من خلال 500 شاب وصبيه وكان شعارها عندنا وطن بدنا دولي uh, so عبد الله also said that we also have we also organize the big initiatives and he would like to share with you a special initiative uh, that they had implemented in Jericho uh, in which uh, the uh, volunteers of uh, Zimam and others held a banner over one uh, kilometer. The, the banner was over uh, one kilometer. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, basically, uh, the theme was, we have a homeland. We need a state. Yeah. The challenges, the challenge. يعني الاحتلال مش شجرة الاحتلال مش تحدي بسيط الاحتلال هو التحدي الأول والأخير أمام الشعب الفلسطيني. He said uh, the occupation, the military occupation, the Israeli military occupation is real and it is number one challenge for, for the political process in Palestine and for doing politics in Palestine. الاحتلال بيأثر على كل شغلنا على شغل المؤسسات المجتمع المدني على الحكومة على الحركات الاحتلال هو عقبة حقيقية في إرساء مجتمع ديمقراطي يتقبل الآخر يعمل على بناء ذاته وبناء دولته The Israeli military occupation is the biggest obstacle to us Palestinians in particular on the political front uh, youth and activists uh, confront a huge problem when it comes to uh, doing political work. And also you must remember that when we speak about Palestine, Palestine is two regions. The mountainous region, that is the West Bank, and the coastal region on the Mediterranean Sea, that is Gaza. And it's very hard, and, oh, it's almost near impossible for Palestinians to travel between the West Bank and Gaza without the permission of the Israeli uh, military occupation. I want to uh, يعني, uh, say example about the, how the occupation challenge. يعني في عنا uh, متطوعين وثلاث جروبات في قطاع غزة uh, بنشتل معهم ثلاث سنين الآن لا هم غدروا يجوا ولا احنا نقدر نصلهم وفقط من خلال السوشيال ميديا أو التلفونات احنا بنشتل احنا وياهم رغم التحديات اللي كمان هي موجودة عندهم أكثر من عنا في الضفة الغربية لكن uh, هذا الاحتلال بمنعنا في التواصل الجغرافي كمان إن احنا نتواصل مع شقة أنا ومع أخوتنا في قطاع غزة He said I just wanted to cite an example uh, Zimam exists uh, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. However, for the past almost uh, three or four years, uh, we haven't been able uh, to bring our activists from uh, the Gaza Strip to the West Bank in order to participate in initiatives, in order to receive basic training or advanced training. So again, he wanted to stress the fact that the Israeli military occupation it stands as the biggest obstacle for political organizing in Palestine. التحدي الثاني اللي انا يعني احنا كشعب فلسطيني بنعتبره مهم الانقسام الوطني الانقسام في داخل الشارع الفلسطيني بين فتح وحماس وارتداداته هذا تاثيره بشكل كبير بياثر علينا ويؤثر على عمل المجتمع الاهلي ويدخل فيه تفاصيل عملنا اليومي بشكل دائم واللي هذا بنحاول دائما احنا نتغلب عليه. The second most important obstacle to uh, political organizing in Palestine is the internal division between the two biggest uh, political movements in Palestine. There is uh, Fatah. Fatah stands for the National Palestinian Liberation Movement and also between Hamas, which stands for the Islamic Resistance Movement. These are the two biggest political parties in Palestine. And almost for the past, let's say, 13, 14 years, uh, an internal division between the two biggest parties existed since Hamas coup uh, against the PLO and uh, the Palestinian Authority in the Gaza Strip back in the summer of 2006. So this is the second most uh, important uh, challenge and its ramifications on uh, political organizing in Palestine is very bad. تحدي ثالث يعني كثير تحديات بس من ابرزها كمان موضوع الدعم وتوفير الميزانيات للمجتمع المدني اللي هاي دائما بنواجه مشكله فيها فخصوصا انه الدعم في عند المسلمين وعند العرب في اغلب بكون هو مربوط بشكل ديني او مربوط بشكل يعني التقرب من الله اليوم يا هنا فهم بتحدي تاعنا كيف احنا ننمي فكر عند المؤسسات وعند الداعمين انه كيف يصير يستثمروا في الانسان الفلسطيني في الشباب الفلسطيني من اجل بناء غد افضل من اجل بناء مجتمع ديمقراطي قادر على تحمل مسؤوليه نفسه. So he said also number three, uh, challenge number three is uh, securing uh, fundings 
for our uh, programs. And this is a big challenge because uh, the nature of uh, uh, like Arabs or uh, Muslims is uh, usually, we, if you are familiar, we have the zakah. And uh, that goes out for charity and also for religious uh, purposes. But uh, when it comes to funding for uh, civil societies or grassroots movements, we actually confront uh, a shortage when it comes to that. And that uh, reflects negatively on our programming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, question number two for Rawan, and I'm going to try to finish this uh, within maybe, w we have one question for each, okay, uh, because we wanted to allow for Q&A. So uh, we're going to go question number two uh, for uh, Rawan. The landscape of today's uh, Palestinian political movement can be described as divided, polarized, and lacking of women's voices. How does your organization work to overcome these challenges? And please, uh, l let's keep it under three minutes because we still have one, two, three questions. Thank you. I, I don't know about that, but okay. <laughs> um, so in order to answer that question, I think I'd like to give you a bit of framework of what it's like for Palestinians today to kind of paint that picture. And I'd like to use that using the New Story Leadership alums of 2019. Thawra, Thawra, which means revolution in Arabic, is from East Jerusalem. She has no Israeli representation or Palestinian representation because of the military occupation. Um, and her 16-year-old brother, Mohammed Abu Khder, was burned alive by the three Israeli settlers. That's East Jerusalem. Then you go to Gaza. Lana, um, our NSL delegate from Gaza, um, hasn't been able to see her four-year-old sister in years. And her sister doesn't recognize what she looks like because she left for a scholarship and hasn't been able to return because of the 10-year siege. Not only that, but Lana's best friend was filming uh, the protests at the border and was shot by an IDF sniper. That's Gaza, and that's one of a million Gazan stories. Then you have the West Bank. Um, our NSL delegate, Mohammed from Azun, um, couldn't get the medical treatment that he needed during the Second Intifada because the IDF created a full blockade and closure in his small village of Azun. He's now 60% paralyzed. These are the stories that aren't unique or rare. These are the stories of the realities that is creating this polarization. The polarization is created by the borders, the checkpoints, the walls. And then you have the lack of women voices, which I think is very important everywhere, all over the world. <laughs> so how does New Story Leadership overcome that? We placed Thaura at Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's office. Not only did Thaura explain to the congresswoman about the implications of the occupation, but she helped push her to co-sponsor the Palestinian children bill that would protect Palestinian children from IDF prisons. That is power. That is political power. Um, I'll tell you another funny story of our um, time on the Hill. Um, I won't mention the congressperson's name, but um, we had a congressman that had an NSL delegate from Gaza, and APAC came to visit the office, as APAC normally does, on Capitol Hill, and the congressman said, Muhammad, you're going to come with me in this meeting. And the APAC lobbyist is going on and on about Israeli security to the congressman, and he says, Muhammad, what do you think, as someone from Gaza? And Muhammad for sure told him what he thought. <laughs> Right. And so, and so to overcome those, and then finally, we also placed, you know, we placed Lana with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's office for the first time. Lana's a hijabi. She saw a hijabi working on Capitol Hill, a lawmaker. We placed Hiba Yazbek, a Palestinian from Nazareth, that faces daily microaggressions 
by the Israeli state, is treated as a second-class citizen for the first time in her life. She was working alongside the first ever Palestinian congresswoman and said, finally, I see an idol I can look up to. That's another thing we need to overcome. <laughs> Finding idols that look like us all over the world. And finally, I think one of the most important things that New Story Leadership does, it teaches our Palestinians how to tell their story. Because you know what? Our story matters. And we need to learn how to say it in a way that people will listen. So that when the time comes for reconciliation to be had, we have the younger generation ready to speak up and demand their needs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and uh, Rowan, I want to give you an extra minute maybe to cite for us examples of these young leaders going back to Gaza, the West Bank and Jerusalem, and using the talent and the skills to become leaders in their community? Th very good question. Um, you know, right now, if we look at the landscape, our alums, New Story Leadership has been going on for 10 years. The first ever Palestinian boxing gym was created by uh, two Palestinian alums, um, Asil Saeed and... Nasa, uh, oh my God, NSL, JUC, Nader JUC. Um, Hamza Awawda is also an NSL alum. He was the director of Yali Young Leaders, a very important initiative empowering youth in media and explaining to them and teaching them how they can raise their voices using online media. Um, we also have uh, Ashraf Awawda, who is now the alumni coordinator for Our Generation Speaks, which is a multi-million dollar entrepreneurship organization that works to make sure that there's social impact within the Palestinian community, um, and obviously me, so. Thank you, great, great. Great. Uh, Mr. al uh, your final question, question number three. Uh, with Palestinian geographic fragmentation, how much does this affect political mobilization? I think this already has been mentioned a lot by Hamarche, and that the geographic fragmentation and the Israeli occupation fragmentation, even inside the West Bank, internally because of the number of checkpoints. You know, there's still roads that yes. the Palestinians cannot drive in, in the West Bank. But before I answer this, I want to mention three things that I believe are fundamental for the Palestinian youth. And this is what you can do because we are here because of you too. Um, what is it can you do? I think there's an issue that nobody discusses that it should be brought up. What about the Palestinian security? We keep hearing Israeli security, Israeli security, Israeli security. All right, but what about the Palestinian security? The Palestinian youth today in Gaza, in Jerusalem, in the West Bank do not feel secure. And this is a thing that we need to work on, and this is something that you have to work on as progressives, is it time to say there is Palestinians and there is Palestinian security in line, in parallel to the Israeli security. That's one. Second one, exposure. Rwan, you mentioned this, Hamarsha, you mentioned this. The more we can expose the young generation to what's going on to, in the world, the more that we can get them to be more active. And this is why you have to support more exposure of the Palestinians. We don't control our borders. We cannot get people in and out. The only way we can get this young generation to be exposed is through programs. So you really have to work on this and supporting this. And this is really fundamental. And the third issue, fragmentation. Unfortunately, occupation succeeded in doing a lot of fragmentation to the Palestinian society. And it's not only geographical. Unfortunately, they've been fighting hard in creating psychological and cultural fragmentation. We have to fight it. Together we have to fight it by saying that the end of occupation is what will be the only way to end this fragmentation. Now we can find new ways to work on it. Technology is growing. We can find ways to work with technology. But this should not place us in a way to forget that this physical fragmentation is the mother of all problems. So what we can do, what we can do is simple. We need to get as much as possible young Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank back together. This physical geographic fragmentation, is a, it's a problem. Most people in the West Bank do not meet young people from Gaza. Really. I mean, because both people cannot travel. So how can we really think of creative ways under occupation, while we really cannot tender this, 
to happen. Also, how can we work with the Congress and the Senate here of coming with a bill that will allow young generation and some people under of specific age to even travel freely from the West Bank, at, at least to the Palestinian side in the, West, in the West Bank, sorry, between Gaza and the West Bank. We have to work together in getting this young generation connected back. And I think that's an issue internally also that the Palestinian, and I make no mistake, this is my last comment. The problem we have with Gaza, it's not Fatah and Hamas. I completely disagree with that. I, I have a problem with looking at it as a Fatah and Hamas and we are all sitting watching two people fighting. It's also an ideological problem between two different ideologies that exist in the leadership in the West Bank and the leadership of Gaza. That's exactly a problem. And I think what we are paying is the price as people of these different ideologies. There's an ideology in the West Bank that's calling for non-violence, calling for peace and negotiation, which is we as young generation today are more in favor of and I think we all can agree on. And there is unfortunate, which is Hamas also is a part of a Palestinian society. Hamas is no enemy to me. Hamas is a Palestinian political party, but they have an ideology that we don't agree on. So we need to convince Hamas to come and be part of the PLO and agree with the strategy that we have an ideology in the PLO. That's exactly what we need to do internally. So it's not a Fatah and Hamas issue. It's an ideology issue, and we need to be, bring Hamas to be part of the PLO. That way they will be part of the Palestinian ministry. Thank well you. said. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> Mr. Hamarshe, do you believe that the civil grassroots movements in Palestine capable of engaging in the political process and the peace process and can effectively contribute to the end of the conflict and the occupation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> الحراك المدني في فلسطين طبعا لا اكيد كان له دور وراح يكون له دور في اي عمليه سياسيه فلسطينيه واي انتخابات فلسطينيه فلسطينيه على مستوى التشريع او البلديه او حتى الرئاسيه واحنا شفنا هذا الحكي يمكن عزه حكى هذا الموضوع انه احنا شفنا المبادره هي انبثقت من جمعيات ومن مؤسسات يعني قاعديه انبثقت وصارت وشاركت حتى على مستوى الرئاسه شاركت وعلى مستوى كمان التشريع شاركت so Abdullah said the civil society organizations, NGOs, the grassroots movements in Palestine in the past, in the present, and in the future will play a vital role in the political process and also the peace process. And he cited the example of the uh, Palestinian initiative uh, led by Dr. Uh, Barghouti, and he said that it came to exist uh, from uh, civil society uh, coalitions around different NGOs and different individuals, and they were able to have a political party that has an impact on the political process in Palestine and also the peace process to some extent. Yeah. Um, in the case of the peace, the peace of 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 رئيسي في كسر الفجوة بين الفلسطينيين والإسرائيليين واستمر هذا الدور وأنا أعتقد أنه في المستقبل إذا ما رجعت المفاوضات راح يكون في لهم دور رئيسي لعمل ضغط وخصوصا في الشارع الإسرائيلي من أجل يعني إرجاع الصوت المعتدلين وصوت السلام داخل المجتمع الإسرائيلي لأن نحن شفنا في آخر عشر سنين ما بعد نتنياهو قديش الصوت المعتدلين وصوت اليسار صوت اليسار في إسرائيل اختفى وبطل موجود في في مهمة يعني على الشعب الفلسطيني إنه ينمي هذا الصوت ويحكي إنه في شريك فلسطيني وفي هذا الشريك الفلسطيني موجود لازم ننمي شريك إسرائيلي يؤمن في إنهاء الاحتلال وإنهاء الصراع ويعني وبناء وعادة بناء الثقة. So he mentioned that uh, the uh, grassroots organizations and civil society organizations, in particular when it comes to the peace process, since its inception in 1993 and the signing of the Oslo Agreement. Uh, there was a need uh, to bridge the gap uh, between uh, the Israeli position and the Palestinian position on the final status negotiation issues, for example. Uh, the Israelis has expectations, the Palestinians has expectations, and the, and the gap is big in between them. A and that was evident in the Camp David negotiation between Chairman Yasser Arafat and back then uh, Prime Minister Yehud Barak. 
uh, the Palestinian delegation and the Israeli delegation uh, disagreed on, 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 on many points when it came to the final status negotiation uh, uh, files. And, and here comes the civil society organizations and the grassroots organizations working uh, in Palestinian society, maybe in Israeli society also, uh, to educate the public about the need to end the occupation and the conflict, and also to prepare the ground for uh, the upcoming uh, solution. So definitely, uh, yes, he said that the civil uh, organization or civil societies or grassroots societies uh, can have an impact. Uh, personally, uh, so uh, I sit here as the moderator, but in the same time, I'm one of the founders of One Voice Movement, uh, which works on the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. And some of the works we had done in Palestine when I was in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank is working and doing town hall meetings and introduction sessions and working with our own people, our own society, the Palestinians, to explain to them what are the challenges to the peace process, what are the position of Israel, what is the position of the PLO, what is the position of the international community, what can be expected as an outcome from the peace process. So there are a lot of challenges, but also there are a lot of opportunities, and the uh, civil uh, societies and grassroots uh, uh, organization role is vital and very important. Uh, final question, uh, question number uh, three. Uh, we'll go to uh, Rawan. And then we're gonna open uh, the uh, floor for Q&A, so if you have a question, please have a question ready and set by the microphone. Thank you. I see a lot of people lining up. So if you have a question, please. Okay, fantastic. Okay, now our final question will go to Rawan. Uh, the, nego the negotiation stalemate and the increasing hopelessness of the Palestinian society is making a peaceful resolution seem almost impossible. How does your organization work to move towards one? Great question. Um, so I think, I mean, it's sort of the elephant in the room in every single conversation about Palestinian, Israeli reconciliation, what does civil society do, how does that relate to the political process. What New Story Leadership does is presents a new model of intersectionality. We're not just bringing Palestinians to talk to one another or to talk to Israelis, we're bringing them in the conversation, the political conversation, in DC and also the diplomatic conversation. This past month we had an alumni conference and we brought our alumni with American, Irish and Swedish diplomats. And our Palestinian alums led facilitated discussions with those diplomats about the political, economic and social situation and how we can move it forward. So what did our Palestinian alums say to the US diplomat? We don't have a neutral party anymore, people. What did they say about economic integration versus political integration? We need a political end goal. It cannot only be political integration. These are young people that are not only saying this as a token Palestinian. They are saying this to leaders and policymakers that are finally listening to the people. That is how we create reconciliation, by empowering the people and making sure they feel a part of the political process so that it's not separate but working together towards one goal. And if you all would like to support an organization like ours, go to our website. <laughs> great, great, thank you, thank you, thank you. So as you see, uh, the, 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 the challenges to political organizing in Palestine can be summed, uh, one, the Israeli military occupation, and two, the internal division between uh, the two biggest uh, political parties and other uh, reasons uh, our panelists have uh, introduced. Now I will open uh, the floor for Q&A. Uh, can you please identify your name and if you are from a particular university or political organization, also say that please. And the question for who? So I hear a lot of talk um, among young Palestinians and some young uh, progressive Israelis about um, doing, having, working towards a one-state secular democracy between the river and the sea. And I'm wondering uh, if you're hearing that from young people that you work with, and how do you respond to that? 
Um, I mean, no. <laughs> Well, the, the thing with New Story Leadership, we don't have a political answer of, of what we think the solution might be, but from the conversations and the meetings that we have with our Palestinian um, alums and delegates and our Israeli alums and delegates, they both recognize the need to each have their own self-determination. Now, when there are Palestinians that say, you know what, life is so difficult, I'm surrounded by five Israeli settlements, I see IDF soldiers every day, how am I going to ever envision a Palestinian state? That's a different story. That's someone that has lost hope. And I think we need to remember that when we hear those conversations. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Next. Thank you so very much to all of you. Um, my name is Ava seligman Kennard. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area for J Street, of course. Um, my question also is for Rowan. Uh, first of all, uh, do you have visa problems getting in here, your folks that you want to invite here? Secondly, your funding, who they get the funding from? And thirdly, are you also speaking with the Jewish community? Are your fellows also speaking with the Jewish community? Thank you. Um, I actually didn't catch your name. What was your name? Ava. Okay, Ava. Um, so you asked a few things. Um, so with our um, funding, our funding comes from everyday Americans that believe in our mission and goal. Um, we place our uh, delegates and American host families in the DC, Maryland area. We also get funding from um, churches, synagogues, mosques. So obviously the interfaith community is also a strong one in terms of our funders. Do we speak to Jewish communities? Absolutely. We definitely engage with, um, with Jewish communities. We speak to synagogues, we speak to uh, Jewish youth groups, and we also understand that the Jewish American community has a huge role to play um, with ending the conflict. I forgot your last question. Oh, v oh God, yes. <laughs> Did she answer it? Okay. My name is Tom Getman. I was an NGO executive in Jerusalem and a UN representative to the Human Rights Council. Um, civil society, thank you for being our models. And I want to say thank you to J Street for having such as you here. That's great. We have a problem in the civil society movement. We do a lot of work for you here on the Hill, raising money for projects and so on. But we're being stifled on your end because we don't have advocacy from the Palestinians to protect us. We've got staff people in prison. We've had staff people expelled. Our funding is blocked from hospitals and other places. Do you have an access route? Bashar, do you have an access route that we can work with? Uh, I, I really don't know, that, I don't know the case, but if there's a case, definitely I would love to help and okay. take exactly what is the problem and understand why there is a problem in the first hand, yeah. and Occupation. how can we solve the problem? Right. I, are they imprisoned? Where? I mean, you have staff who are imprisoned? Yes. In the Palestinian? Four years for trumped up charges, pardon the expression. No, it's all right. I mean, in the, in the, end, in the end, I would love to look okay, into this I'll case. Okay, I'll talk to you after. Uh, yes, definitely. Thank yes, you. Yes. Hi, my name is Fimi. I come from the Colorado College, and I was wondering about the political support for the two-state solution and how does it pose a challenge for your political initiatives in Palestine? Do you think it's sufficient for the two-state solution to happen and for your mobilization, political mobilization, or no? And what can we do about it? Who is the question for? All of you, if, or anybody you who like wants to answer. answer. Okay, so Mr. Hamash is gonna answer your question, okay? And mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, we spoke about the two-state solution for a long time. The people of Palestine have a big deal in the two-state solution. 
The Palestinian people had already introduced a big concession when it came to the two-state solution to make it possible. في يعني المجتمع الدولي يمكن المجتمع الإسرائيلي مش فاهمين هاي المسألة لكن إحنا قدمنا تنازل كبير فمن أجل حل الدولتين يعني أبو عمار خطوة خطأ خطوة كبيرة في هذا في الواحد وتسعين في في مدريد وفي ثلاثة وتسعين في أوسلو من أجل يعني بناء دولة على حدود السار الرابع من حزيران لكن التحديات كبيرة من هذا الموضوع شو بدنا نعمل ففي كثير أشياء نعملها so he said again, you know, the Palestinian people had introduced painful concession in 1988 in order to make possible for the emergence of a two-state solution. We've been at it for the past almost 26, 27 years, and uh, it seems that uh, it's a long time. And maybe some Israelis and some Jewish people don't understand these big concessions that the Palestinian had introduced in order to make possible the two-state solution. But I assure you that the Palestinian people had introduced very painful concessions. Uh, yep. For example, 78% uh, will be the state of Israel, and only 22% will be for the Palestinians. But until now, we didn't reach that yet. Yeah. الواقع في الضفة الغربية إذا بتيجي تزور الضفة الغربية بتطلع من جنين للخليل بتشعر أنك أنت في يعني في غابة من المستوطنات. If you leave, for example, from Jenin, which is in the, which is in the uh, north, uh, to Hebron, the Khalil, which is in the south, you feel that you are in a forest of Israeli settlements in in the West Bank. في اعتقادي المستوطنات هي العقبة الأولى والكبيرة فهم في تحقيق يعني حل الدولتين. بالإضافة ل يعني عدم وجود قيادة في في إسرائيل تؤمن في هذا الحل وتؤمن في واقعيته وإمكانية تنفيذه على أرض الواقع. So again, he mentioned that the settlements are the biggest obstacle. Israeli settlements are the biggest obstacle to the two-state solution. And also, uh, he mentioned that we need a political leadership in Israel. Wanted to implement the two-state solution. وأنا في في مجتمع ال ال في في مؤتمر الجاستريت فهم مع يعني أغلب الحضور هنا يهود وإسرائيليين فهم أنا بدعوهم من هنا للضغط على قيادتهم من أجل تطبيق حل الدولتين وإنهاء الصراع الفلسطيني الإسرائيلي قبل ما المستوطنين يعني يتحكموا في كل يعني في في الأرض وفي القيادة الإسرائيلية. And from here, from Washington, from the J Street Conference. Where are uh, many Jews and Israelis? I call upon you to exert pressure and your leadership in order to restrain the settlers and the settlement movement. Because if it continues to be like this, the settlers are going to hijack the agenda and uh, they are going to control what will happen. I, I just want to add one thing. Um, by exerting pressure, it's, it's not a hard thing to do. Just call your representative. If you're passionate about a two-state solution in Israeli state alongside a Palestinian state, call your representatives and say, you need to get on this now. So that's just to give you practical advice. But, but just, there's an issue here. The issue of two-state, one-state is not an issue of, for us, the Palestinian state is not only borders and sovereignty. It's also a right for self-determination. The right to exist, make no mistake, this is exactly what we're looking at. It's not only just the issue of borders and sovereignty. There's a lot of unions right now in Europe and other places where border is not an issue. But the right of self-determination and existence is what these young people are looking for. Now, is it a two-state or one-state model? If they get this dignity, freedom, and justice, then the model itself is not an issue. And we don't want to focus on the one-state, two-state, ignoring the fundamentals as a human being that those people should have. That's the answer to your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, one second, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, and we have five minutes, okay? So I'm going to allow each one of you in less than one minute to ask your question, and then we're gonna have like six, seven questions, okay? And then maybe some questions are similar, okay? But I wanna hear from all of you. Say, say your question, your name, the organization or university you are from, and then please allow for the other person behind you. Sure. Uh, my name is Josh, I'm from the University of Illinois. Uh, I guess my question would be for either Bashar or Rawan. Um, during the first intifada, there was a lot of women-led, labor-led movements, there were strikes in the West Bank, there were a lot of different uh, protesting factors that really seemed to spur on the Madrid Conference, which in turn spurred the Oslo Accords, and yet it doesn't seem like there's been anything 
quite like like the second intifada was much different than the first one. So it seems like that one was a lot more uh, um, labor labor led. Where is that? Like, like can we, will we see more of that? Because that would be, I think, a really uh, productive thing to see. Bernie 2020. Thank you. Bernie 2020. Fine. <laughs> Next, Jason Berkovich from San Diego. Um, here in the U.S., we just were fortunate to hear from Julian Castro and Mayor Pete. Later, we're going to hear from Bernie Sanders. We also have Elizabeth Warren, wide age spectrum there. In Israel, you've got Ayelet Shaked and Tamar Sandberg on one side. You've also got Bibi, who's been around for forever on the other side. Ehud Barak's been around for a while, too. So there's a wide range in ages as to who's politically active. I'm wondering, within the PA, the PLO, um, Mahmoud Abbas is in his 80s. You've got um, Mashal, who's in his 60s now. Where's the next generation within Palestinian political movements? Who are the next generation of Palestinians that we need to listen to? Great question. They are Thank on you. the stage. Thank you. Next. Your name? My name is Jonah Karsh. I run the J Street U chapter at the University of Miami in Florida. Um, my question is for everyone, but maybe most specifically Rowan. You talked a lot about the importance of um, the Palestinian youth that come to work in Congress, hearing from uh, Congress people, what, what do you need from us? I, I want to ask that question on behalf of J Street. As a pro-Israel organization, there's going to be a level of implicit bias. But um, J Street, you, J Street, we care about Palestinians. We want to see peace. We want to see human rights for everyone. So my question, just very briefly, is like, what does J Street, you need to be doing and J Street, big, need to be doing to make you guys feel heard? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, J Street, you. Next. Hi, my name is Kara. Uh, I also run the J Street, you chapter at Harvard. And I feel really fortunate that I get to hear from you. And every time I hear from Palestinians who come to the US, you all have these incredible stories and I know have overcome incredible challenges to be here and have, um, with all of the challenges with visas and travel within the Palestinian territories and to get to the United States. Can you speak practically about what it's like for a Palestinian to try to come out, to leave the country, to travel from the West Bank to Gaza so I can share those stories with people I speak to here in the US? Great, thank you. Thank you. And, and I wanted to send a shout out for J Street U. We were there on the night of the opening and we heard your position on Palestine and we support it. Thank you, J Street U. Hi, my name is Yoni. I'm from Harvey Mudd College in California. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, Bashar, you mentioned how necessary it is to uh, mend the division between Hamas and Fatah. Um, do you think that's possible and what do you think are the obstacles and opportunities for making that happen? Thanks. Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Mary from Northwestern University. I was wondering about what Palestinian liberation really looks like beyond states um, and how that feels and looks like. And if, talk about that. Thank you. Northwestern University in Chicago? Yeah. We'll talk. Next. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Zach. I'm from Stony Brook, New York. And my question is for Rwan. There is an experiment going on in Rojava, Syria, which is the predominantly Kurdish region, and it's based in non-hierarchical self-determination to oppose Assad and the jihadist rebels. Um, do you believe that considering that the Israeli political class diverges heavily from their population and the people they're annexing, that um, this is a viable model, the Rojavan model for Palestinians? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I'm getting signs. Do we have time? Oh, fantastic. Five more minutes, okay? Uh, great. So each one of you can pick, uh, you know, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Oh, okay. Good. All right, I wanted to end. Um, it's okay. J Street U, what can you do? Bring more Palestinian voices to campus so more students <laughs> understand. Um, the young lady that asked about how Gazans get out, it takes years, three years. Our average in New Story leadership in getting a Gazan to Washington, D.C. takes us three years. And the stories are horrific. I don't think we have time for that, but I'd be happy to point you to our wall of stories on our website where you can hear just how horrific it is for them to even get the opportunity to come here and speak up. Um, Palestinian liberalization movement. Oh, that's all I wrote. Okay. Forgot the question. <laughs> Mr. Lazza, you want to take a question? She will have a minute in the end to end it up. I'm sure she has something exciting to talk about more than I will do. But the questions, the second intifada versus the first intifada. 
the first intifada was a different, uh, an uprising. Uh, it's uh, an uprising of, it, that started with a mix of civil and national rights. At the second intifada, we all know the armed conflict that existed. But I can tell you and guarantee you that the young people today are the people of the first intifada. They are the people of the civil society, they're the people of nonviolence, and they're the people of peace. They do not view uh, violence as a way to end the conflict and to end the occupation. So if that's the question I'm answering you and I'm telling you, this is exactly the generation that we have today. But the conflict we had in 1989 is not the conflict we have today. We have Oslo, there's an agreement. Palestinians respect the agreement, while Israel is not even respecting 1% of that agreement. While nobody holds Israel accountable for unilaterally pulling out of those agreements. Most people ignore the fact that Israel is not respecting Oslo Agreement. This is really a fact, and nobody at the Capitol Hill is talking about it. We need to talk about it. Israel is obliged to fulfill its commitment to that agreement. The second question, as I say, it's not Hamas and Fatah. It's a mistake to say it's Hamas and Fatah. It's a, it's a different ideology that Hamas have, yes, and that the PLO and the West Bank have. I think this could be over, definitely would be over. But first, you need to get a lot of those players out. Gaza is not only Hamas. You have international presence there, the regional presence of many countries who are interested in this division, including Israel and including Palestinians who are interested in this. Is there a light in the end of the tunnel? Yes, because reconciliation, Palestinian, Palestinian reconciliation is an important issue. You need Gaza to be part of a Palestinian contiguous state or there is no state. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Good point, thank you, yes. And finally, Abdullah will take a, a question or yeah. a remark and then we'll have your minute, Rowan. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, uh, extremists are present everywhere. Um, the settlers and the uh, settlement enterprise really represent a big challenge for both Palestinian and Israeli who wanted to end this conflict. So the lady asked about if Iran has a visa, but I wanted to tell you that if you want to travel from Ramallah city to Jerusalem city, which takes 10 minutes, you need at least three days to get there. And sometimes you don't because the Israelis don't give you a visa. This situation must change. This is our role in the whole world. Martin Luther King here in Washington said, I have a dream. Martin Luther King here in Washington said, I have a dream. Here in J Street, I say, we have a dream. We have a dream to end the conflict. We have a dream to end the conflict. To end the conflict. To end the <laughs> to end the occupation and to do peace. All right. <laughs> great, great. Rowan, you want to have your one minute? Oh, gosh, you guys all got up. But um, what I wanted to say, and I, I thank you all for coming and listening to the younger generation of Palestinians that are ready to rise to the moment. And we will, but we need your help. And you're, you can help us by this very simple saying that News Story Leadership says all the time. Don't talk about us without us. Include us in your political conversations and make sure that the Palestinian voice rises to the moment to a Palestinian state and ending the occupation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.